Coming up in today's show, mega cap tech stocks get too big for the NASDAQ 100. Bitcoin forecast to reach 50,000 by the end of the year. Carl Icahn makes a comeback against a short seller's attack. What's in store for earnings season starting later this week? Why now could be a good time to get in on gold? And Sarah Silverman sues ChatGPT. Welcome back to the Click Capital Daily Show, everybody. I hope you had a great weekend. My name's Jared, and I'm going to run you through all the most important news, data, and charts from the markets today. So hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. And so the big story out today was late Friday afternoon, we got news that the NASDAQ 100 index is going to rebalance their index, basically decreasing the weightings of mega cap tech as they think it's become a bit too concentrated. And so this is a special rebalance they, they can do. They've only done this twice before, many years ago. And basically, it'll go into effect later this month. And that's so all those index funds around the world will have to sell a little bit of the mega cap tech and buy more of the bottom 93 stocks in the NASDAQ 100 index. And so the market obviously priced that in today. And we can see that in mega cap tech's performance. All of them came off except Meta. And overall today, we saw a pretty good breadth out there. A lot of small caps and mid caps did well, especially in industrials, consumer cyclicals, and across the healthcare sector as well. And apart from NVIDIA, semis had a good day too. And so this special rebalance of the, of the NASDAQ 100 index is done to address the over-concentration in the index. And according to NASDAQ, there's more than 300 billion in exchange traded funds tracking the index, which was measured at the end of 21. So it's probably a lot higher now. And the last time they did a special rebalance was back in May 2011 and before that, December 98. And so NASDAQ's rules state that if all stocks with a weighting of more than 4.5% in the index exceed 48%, then the NASDAQ rebalances the indicator. Under their rules, the rebalancing process sets the aggregate weight of stocks with a weighting of 4.5% or more at 40%. And so this will go in effect on July 24. And so just looking at the charts here of these mega cap tech stocks affected, we can see Apple's down a bit off, a bit more than 1% on volume. Same with Microsoft, down 1.6%. And we've had these really good parabolic rises the last couple of months in mega cap tech. And we can see our wave flow indicator here on Microsoft just starting to go red. And we just closed underneath the 50-day VWAP. So things may be starting to change here in mega cap tech, especially in Google off 2.5% today. Similar story in Amazon off 2%. Nvidia just down a little bit still kind of consolidating and coiling up here. Tesla is off 1.7% but still on a short term uptrend and the best price action of them all is Meta which actually finished the day up 1.2% as the market might be liking the performance of their newest app Threads which is apparently at 100 million signups now. But of course it's easy to get those signups when you've already got a billion users and all they need to do is click a button from within Instagram to sign up for the new app. Another news out today we've got Standard Chartered Bank saying Bitcoin could reach 50,000 by the end of the year. It may hit 100,000 by the end of next year. And they're saying Bitcoin's got a number of tailwinds now, including turbulence in the banking sector, stabilization in broader risky assets, improved profitability for Bitcoin miners, the upcoming Bitcoin halving event, progress in global regulation, institutional investor interest, and a decline in volatility in Bitcoin. And just looking at the price of Bitcoin, we do have some bullish seasonality coming in over the next 10 days. And it is still holding up just above this $30,000 zone where we found a lot of resistance before and it seems to keep rejecting off this $31,000. i will just take you down to a four hour chart and so we can get a better look at the price action. You can see every time we come up here so far over the last couple of weeks, it's getting rejected and sold off. So the market's kind of a bit indecisive here. And I'd say it needs some more good news out that the SEC is going to approve these applications from BlackRock. Fidelity and others to go ahead with spot Bitcoin ETFs because then that's going to open the gates to a lot of institutional money and legitimacy for Bitcoin as an asset and a lot of big portfolios out there, which could then well and truly drive Bitcoin a lot higher from here. What's also helping Bitcoin and other assets is the dollar, which has been a bit weak the last couple of days. We're back down into the support zone at 101.6. A story we've been following on this channel is the attack from the short seller Hindenburg Research on Carl Icahn's company. Icahn Enterprises, which saw the stock get cut in half and sold off dramatically. But Carl's come back over the weekend and he's amended those personal loans that were tied to the stock price, which was a big key point of Hindenburg Research's attack on his business. So we knew he was going to fight back and he came up with a creative new agreement where he converted the margin debt into a three-year term loan and a deal struck with five major banks. So it's tied the value to the firm's net asset instead of the stock price like it had been before. And looking at the chart, that's obviously what the market was looking for. Big gap up and rally today finished up 20% on much bigger volume than usual 7 million shares. Got Q2 earnings season kicking off later this week with the big banks, JP Morgan, Citigroup, Wells reporting first up as usual. And so analysts are expecting the earnings to climb for the S&P 500 for Q2 
this year is negative 7.2%. And if that's the case, that'll be the largest earnings decline reported by the index since Q2 2020 in the middle of COVID lockdowns. And this will be the third consecutive decline in corporate earnings as well. So while we've got inflation coming off a bit, that's also affecting corporate earnings as inflation was a big driving factor in the increase in those corporate earnings. And that gives us now a forward 12-month PE ratio in the S&P 500 just under 19, which is a bit above the 10-year average of 17.4 and still very expensive when compared against the current bond yields as well. And according to this measure, gold could beat the stock market in the coming weeks based on a lot of investment newsletters being very bearish on the precious metal. And then a lot of these market time has been very bullish on the stock market. And so we can see what they think of gold as a percent toll of distribution since the year 2000 were now in the low teens of extreme pessimism so for contrarians out there like me this is the data i like to look at and i like to go against the crowd not all the time but where it can make sense it can turn out to be really good trades and so just looking at the price of gold futures here on the charts we're currently at 1930 dollars an ounce it's kind of just been drifting lower on low volatility not many people talking about it. it's not really up in the media as it was back here as we we're approaching all-time highs we actually got four dollars within all-time highs at 2089 an ounce and just taking you out to a monthly chart here i mean one could argue technically this is looking like a triple top however i've got a feeling with the macro backdrop now with high inflation geopolitical tensions central banks stockpile gold market time is pessimistic on the price of gold and current gold allocations amongst large portfolios being low i think that all gives a good reason why we could come back up and test these all-time highs again over the coming weeks and i wouldn't be surprised to see gold actually have a really good rally in the second half of the year especially if we see the stock market pull back and gold is, is ripping up to new highs that should exacerbate that uptrend as a lot of people seek shelter in the precious metal if it's one of the only things that's rallying and a trend that could help inflation fall further is used vehicle prices dropped by a record amount for the month of June. And that was 4.2% from the previous month and 10.3% year over year. And so we've got CPI coming out later this week. It's probably the biggest economic data point this week we'll be looking at. And the price of used cars goes into that. So that should help with inflation's downward trajectory. And in more signs that China's economy is, is pretty weak is that they're on the brink of deflation, if you would believe it. Adding to calls over there of getting a big stimulus package going to revamp their economy. That's because their consumer price index was unchanged last month from a year earlier. And it was the weakest rate since February 21. So the CCP is likely to get underneath this and put a floor in here with the big stimulus package, which could be really good for the price of commodities. And just looking at the commodity index ETF DPC, we can see that's still holding this big support zone here just above its 50. And if we were to see a big government spending program out of China, that should help give commodities a lift across the board. Another news out today, we've got Sarah Silverman and a few others opening a lawsuit against OpenAI, which owns the real popular ChatGPT. And this does bring a few questions about how AI operates, because what what Silverman and two others are claiming is that OpenAI and Meta, which they're also suing, their AI models were trained in part on vast digital book collections known as shadow libraries that contain unlicensed copyrighted material. So they're saying that ChatGPT can summarize Silverman's book, returns a detailed summary of the book, and she's saying it wouldn't be possible to provide that summary without having the full text in the training model. And so that's what these large language AI models are based on, is basically they just read every single bit of data out there they can and are trained on it all. And then the owners of these AI just add in their political considerations on top of that. And then basically, so when you're talking to ChatGPT, it's just like talking to a really knowledgeable person who knows just about everything. But if she and others are successful in this, and then that'll really limit the amount of data and information that these AI chatbots can look at and learn from. And so so this will be an interesting story that I'll continue paying attention to to see what the outcome of is. I've got a bunch of interesting charts for you today. The first is oil in the Strategic Petroleum Reserve total, also known as the SPR, which peaked out in the early 2010s, a bit above 700 million barrels. The start of 2022 were just under 600 million barrels. Then the Biden administration released a whole bunch to combat inflation and from the ongoing wars out there. And so you can see it got really low and now the Biden administration is committed to filling that back up. And that along with OPEC, Saudi Arabia wants the price of oil back to $80 a barrel. And if China does stimulus, that should help keep a bit of a floor under oil here in the high 60s. Another chart today is Wall Street is sharply split on their S&P 500 targets. It's one of the biggest gaps between strategists 
highest and lowest targets. So we've got a bunch of people out there saying the S&P 500, we're in a new bull market, AI has changed everything. And you know, there is some valid arguments there because if AI over the coming years allows for these big mega cap tech companies and others to lay off thousands of staff well, still be able to operate as normal, then that's going to increase their margins. And they've got a lot of other strategists looking at the macro backdrop, slowing global growth, the inverted yield curve, record consumer, government debt, the government spending on the decrease, and all these other things are pointing to that we could take out those October lows from last year. So that's creating a, a big divergence in the highest and lowest targets out there. But overall, strategists expect the most bearish finish to the second half of this year on record, with the average result expecting second half the S&P to finish down about 8%. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to come true. On average, analysts are often wrong. So I would take this one with a big grain of salt. Another interesting dynamic we've got going on in the market is the three-month correlation among S&P 500 stocks is at the lowest level for the last six years. And so there's a lot of dispersion out there in the stock market. We've obviously got the Magnificent 7, the top seven stocks in the NASDAQ absolutely ripping this year. Whereas most other stocks have been in kind of a sideways downtrend. And what you'll see in the stock market is when things go really bad, correlation moves towards one. As all the fundamental factors in each industry and business kind of goes out the window and the short term need for liquidity kind of comes to the forefront. And that kind of causes correlations to go towards one like we saw in the COVID when basically everything was getting sold as people needed to raise liquidity. And we can see that three month correlation got to about 90% where where we are now is under 20%. And there's still a lot of people out there in the media saying, you know, the jobs market's still really strong. It's really intact. The consumer's still there. So don't worry about the inverted yield curve. Maybe it's wrong this time. However, if you look back at data from 1968 to 2018 on average, we're actually following the average price almost to the T. Down the bottom here is the months from the first inversion of the 10 year, three month yield. And so you can see we're about seven months into the inversion. And historically employment, which is indexed here at 100 at the start of the inversion, will typically peak out 11, 12 months after we first went inverted. So according to this chart, we've got maybe another four or five months of the job market holding up before it starts to turn. And when the job market turns, that's the big indicator of the recession. As obviously when people lose their jobs, they're going to pull back their discretionary spending. And that's what caused a contraction in the economy. Okay, back over to the charts. And so we've got the S&P 500 closing just above 4,400. Reasonably flat today. The Qs were basically flat. And there's the effect of that rebalancing. So we've got the NASDAQ equal weight up 1.8% today on big volume. So that's a lot of traders and hedge funds getting ahead of the actual rebalancing the index funds have to do later this month. Basically that 300 billion plus linked to NASDAQ indices, they'll have to buy more of the other 93 stocks in the NASDAQ and sell the mega cap ones. So we saw that play out in the price action there today. And also saw a bit of good price action in breadth in the mid, mid caps and Russell 2000 as well finished up 1.7%. International stock indices were basically flat, just calling up a bit here. And we saw the VIX nine day up 7% to 13.5 and the VIX just above 15. Still got that volatility risk premium moving up a little bit as option dealers are demanding a bit more premium over what the actual volatility in the market is right now. And there's that improved breadth today with 72% of stocks above their 20 day average. But we're not getting breakouts on the amount of stocks making new highs. Growth versus defensive sectors continues to tick higher. And a pretty good move today in high beta stocks versus low volatility actually broke out for the year. And there's a look at the Russell 2000 versus SP500. Pretty good up move today. Bouncing off this support zone that we've been watching. There's a 10 year government bond yield sitting at 4% flat. The 20 year treasury bond ETF TLT sitting right at the bottom of this support zone here. It last found support. In, in early March. Pretty good move up in lumber futures today. And over to stock sectors, a lot of green across the board. We had ARC up 3.7%. Clean energy was the winner with PBW up 3.9% to multi-month highs. Another good day for the home builders. Really nice bounce up in biotech and still a bit of weakness in the defensive sectors like utilities. And so there's a quick look at our sector trends table indicator. And we can see utilities, staples, and healthcare, the defensive sectors of the stock market are in downtrends on all time frames. And we can see a little bit of weakness up the front and consumer discretionary tech communications and those traditional sectors like energy, industrials, and financials still holding up there pretty good. Another good day there for BlackRock up 1.7% as the market may be liking the fact that they're going to be the first one out with a spot Bitcoin ETF, which should be really popular. And there's JP Morgan just kind of hanging around this resistance zone just above it here. And they'll be one of the first to report in Q2 for the Q2 earnings season on Friday this week. So we'll be looking at them 
for some insights into the economy and to hear from Jamie Dimon, which Wall Street pays close attention to. I've already covered mega cap tech earlier in this video, but there's another look at Microsoft. So we'll be looking to see if this can follow through and it stays underneath the 50 day VWAP as signs that potentially the mega cap tech trade has come off and maybe it's just that news of the Nasdaq 100 rebalancing. That could be the event that sets off a bit of a wider pullback in the Magnificent 7 as they're calling them, as we've had such a great run this year, especially in Apple with this tight parabolic uptrend. Be very surprised if it stayed like this for the rest of the year. And just looking at that weekly chart on Apple, I mean, we shouldn't be that surprised if we did get a bit of a pullback to the 38% level, which would take us a bit below 170, as the market may have got a little too comfortable in this trade. Over to the meme space and another good day out there. There's Carvana ripping up 16.3% again. You heard me talk about this one on Friday, saying there's a lot of good momentum in the stock price and it's still trading at less than half sales. And so that news of the price of used cars dropping doesn't seem to have got investors in Carvana worried at all. There's a quick look at hot stock Rivian finishing up 3.2% today, but on a bit of a spinning doji here, maybe at a bit of a short term top. There's a quick look at Royal Caribbean Cruises still holding up there just above 103 and super microcomputer just breaking out by a few ticks to new year to day highs. One of the best performing stocks in the market this year. However, we are on a bearish nine count and on these bearish divergences on our indicators as well. So for a sign of a healthy stock market, we want to see leaders like super microcomputer continue to break out. And a little bump up in the regional banks today with a lot of them reporting earnings in the next two weeks. So the market will be looking to them for their numbers, guidance, and how much they're lending for insights into the economy. There's a quick look at our S&P 500 oscillator at 51.8 creating this really strong bearish divergence as well with the market. And we've got these bearish divergences on our DSI and hidden divergence on the SP500 and NASDAQ as well that's kind of stalling out here. So with the news of that rebalancing, I mean, that could be a good reason for the NASDAQ, which is dominated by the mega cap techs, to have a bit of a pullback here. And we've now got Microsoft underneath a 50-day. Google's already underneath there. Apple, Nvidia, Tesla are kind of weak as well. Meta's still holding up near the highs. And so I guess we'll be looking forward to those CPI numbers due out on Wednesday for another read on inflation. But as it stands right now, the market's pricing a 93% chance the Fed will hike later this month and 24% chance will hike again in September. So I was just wondering how much more can the Fed do before the tech stocks really start to wake up and take note of it? Because so far this year, the Nasdaq doesn't seem to care that the Fed is still on a hiking path. So with all that, I continue to remain market neutral and we'll see what the CPI comes in on Wednesday. That's it for this Monday. Thanks very much for tuning in to Click Capital and let's all have a good week. Cheers.